words of power because we are kings and our words matter. A lot of people are there with that problem, you know. They're good people. But the problem is they think it's their good works that will qualify them for every good thing that comes from God. But the fact is, before you started doing any good works, God has already given every good thing to you. This is a new song that, uh, well, it's not a new song, it's an older song, but we're going to do it again. Sing it with me, speak it up. We're going to sing it slow now, right? Jesus, you're my master and my king. Jesus, you're my Lord, my everything. Jesus, it's your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody try it. Jesus. You're my master and my king, Jesus. You're my Lord, my everything, Jesus. It's your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Everybody, join in, come on. Jesus, you're my master and my king, Jesus. You're my Lord, my everything, Jesus. It's your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah. See it one last time, all right? Jesus. You're my master and my king, Jesus. You're my Lord, my everything, Jesus. Your blood that made me clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus puts in these words so beautifully to help us to realize what the Father's art is like. He sees the sinner, he has compassion. He sees the fallen people, he has compassion. He sees their troubles, he has compassion. He sees their poverty, he has compassion. He sees how they're suffering at the hands of the devil, beaten black and blue, suffering, defeated, trampled upon by the circumstances, powerless. When God sees people like that, people who don't know God, without God and without hope and without any promises in the world, he's moved with compassion. And runs to him literally. That's what it says. Had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, see, I want you to point out something. After he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him, then only the son says. This is very important. What did the son say? Father, I've sinned against, same thing, you know. I've sinned, sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Why I'm pointing out that first the falling upon the neck and kissing happened and then only the son spoke. I want to point out to you, the father did not fall upon his neck and kiss him and welcome him because he said, Father, look, I'm now straight. I have now reformed. I have now changed. I'm a whole lot, lot better than what I was before. I've had a real change of mind and I've, I'm really trying to do better. No, none of that explanation has been given yet. No talk yet. The father saw him in the most pitiful condition. He never asked him, are you now going to behave? Are you going to read your two psalms every day and come to church with us every Sunday? And do every work that we give you? No. <laughs> The father didn't ask any such thing. The son never promised any such thing. The son never told anything about his change of heart or anything like that. Nothing like that. Nothing happened. The father simply saw him in a pitiful, utterly despicable condition. In a condition where nobody would want to go near him and touch him and hug him. 
But the father went and hugged him and kissed him before he spoke even one word to him. Before the son spoke one word to him. So I'm pointing out that to you to tell you that it is not that the son promising him that he'll behave and he'll be better off now that he was received. Not on that basis. It was grace that received him. It was God's love that took him in. It had nothing to do with how much better he has become and how he'll behave hereafter uh, and so on. It was only the grace, utter grace and uh, love of God that received him and took him in. All right. He said, after he kissed him, the, he says, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm not worthy to be called your son and so on, right? But look at the response of the father. See, this is the sequence. He, went, he goes and kisses him, sees him far off, goes, runs and kisses him and welcomes him. Then the son says, you know, I've sinned against you, I've done wrong. And then the father, the response like this, the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, verse 22. As soon as the son said, I've sinned, not worthy to be called your son, look at the response of the father. What did the father say? The father is speaking to the servants now. He says, bring out the best robe, put it on him. Put on a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. What kind of response is this? The son is falling. I mean, I mean, the son is literally looking at him and saying, I have sinned against you and God. You know, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And this man is talking to the servants, saying, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals. Why? The robe, the robe is called the best robe. The best robe is the best robe that they had in the house. Usually belonged to the man of the house. It is the best piece of clothing that is there in the house. Most honored person in the house will wear it. Probably his father's. Tells him, bring it. He didn't say get something that's used or something that's there that's not so good. He says, give the best robe. And they bring the best robe and put it on him. Ring. Ring is a very important thing in Jewish culture. It's not just for show they wear it. They wear it because it is a sign of authority in the family, that he is the son. It shows that he is the son and with the ring that he can actually transact business in those days. The ring meant something greater than what we mean today. So the ring was very important. It showed that he is part of the family as authority of the family and so on. And... Uh, the sandals. No servant would wear sandals. Only the sons could wear sandals in those days. So the sandals very important. So all these, this robe, ring and sandals were in response to what the son said. Remember, the father runs and kisses him, welcomes him. The son says, I've sinned against you and God. I'm not worthy to be your son. And the response to it is the robe the ring and the sandals. What kind of response is this? The robe is the father's response to his words, Father, I have sinned. Why? Because the robe is a very special robe. It's the best robe. They wouldn't have put it on him as he was because he was so dirty from head to toe. They would have taken him, washed him from head to toe, put good perfume on him, cleaned him up good, combed his hair, made him look good, then put on this best robe, you know, not as he was, but after cleaning him up. That cleansing symbolized the cleansing with which God cleanses us and makes us whole. He said, Father, I have sinned. And the father's response is, don't worry, I'll clean you up. And clothe you with my righteousness, with the best robe. The next thing, the ring, is in response to what this boy said. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. That's what he said. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. What is father's response? He says, bring the ring. He says, no, you are my son. You say you're not worthy. I say you are worthy. I call you son. Therefore, you shall be son. That's what it meant. So verse, um, 
verse 21 and 22 have to be understood in that way. The son speaks and verse 22 is the response of the father to what the son said. The son said, I've sinned. The father said, I'm going to give you a robe. We're going to clean you up and put this robe. That cleansing has to do with the cleansing and forgiveness that God gives to us today. He said, bring the ring. Why? Because he said, I'm not worthy to be a son. God says, no, I am making you my son. You will be my son and you are my son. He's given the authority of the son. Thirdly, sandals. What is that in response of? He said, I'm not worthy to be your son. Then he said, I want to be your servant, not son. God is saying, you are not a servant. You are son. Servants don't wear shoes. You wear shoes because you are not a servant. You are son. See how, what a meaningful story Jesus is telling here. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. He was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you, I have never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might, make, I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood to the harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Let me just say a few things about this older boy because this, this is part of the story. The older son comes. He doesn't know what is happening in the house. The younger boy has come, robe has been put on, ring has been given, sandals have been given, musicians have been called. You know, we left that verse without reading it, but it says that in verse, um, in, in verse 23, bring the fatted calf here, kill it, let's eat and be merry, and so on. So, Party has started. The older son does not know it. He's busy working. He's a faithful worker, you see. He's out there in the field somewhere far away, working, finishes his work. He comes and he hears some noise. He asks one of them what's happening. And they say, your father is very happy today because his son, lost son, has come back. So he has asked, to, asked us to kill a fatted calf. He's invited musicians, dancers. So we're having a big party and so on. And the guy is raging Mad, you know, I mean, angry. Does not want to come in. The father goes and begs him to come in, but he does not want to, he, he does not want to come in. Now, look at what he says. He said to his father, these many years I have been serving you, I have never transgressed any commandment, your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat I might, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Look at the comparison. He talks about himself and his brother. Look at the kind of comparison he made. He, say he presents himself as the most righteous, the best guy in town, which he was in many ways. But he's very self-righteous and proud. Proud, self-righteous, and he's very unkind, uncharitable. You know, nothing wrong with being good, but he counted on his goodness to get him over. He counted on his goodness to qualify him for blessings. He counted on his goodness and thought that will bring him the father's favor. What he did not realize was, before he was this good, he already had the father's favor, because verse 12 says, when the father divided the land and gave it to the younger, he also divided the land to the elder. He says, you have given me nothing, that's wrong. The father has given me two-thirds of his wealth. That's why the father says later on, everything that I have is yours. Whatever he has taken, he has taken. One third he has taken. Two thirds is left, and that's all we have. And all that belongs to you. You are the heir to all these things. So to say that you have given me nothing is wrong. He thinks being good is what qualifies him for all the blessings of the Father. He said, I've been so good. You have given me nothing. You never killed a fatted calf for me. He said, 
Father says, you could have killed 100 parrot cubs if you want. There's plenty of them here. You could have had a party every day. But he's a straight-faced guy. He's always working, you know, very serious. He just doesn't know how to party, you know. <laughs> he's one of those guys that comes to church and sits straight, you know, and goes home, you know. Does not even relax. Yeah, he's faithful with certain things, and he, he doesn't go and uh, waste his money like this younger son and do the things that the younger son does, and that's very good. But the thing is, what is wrong with him is he's self-righteous. What is self-righteousness? Self-righteousness is where a person thinks that it is good deeds that qualifies him before God the Father for blessings. He thinks, because I am good, that is why you must give me all these things. But the fact is, before he started being good, God has given everything. His father has given everything to him already. There is nothing more to give. The father completely give, has given everything to him. What this is, what Jesus is trying to show is, it's all by grace, not by your works. See, the younger boy also believed in his works. He thought, I'll go and work myself. I'll be a servant. I will work my way. I will feed myself. I will earn my wages. I will earn my money. That's the way he approached. The father wouldn't take it, you know, because it's not by your work, but by your, his grace. So before he even started talking about it, the father said, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals, and made him the son and gave him everything. This older boy has got a serious problem. This guy at least went far away and went crazy and lived wild and lost everything. And in that way, he was, he was at a great distance and he was lost. But this guy was right at home and was lost. You know, this guy is also lost because he has never known. He is living at home. He does not know how much the father loves him. He does not know what has brought him all the blessings, how, much, how he became the owner of everything. He does not realize. He didn't do anything to own all these things. The only thing that qualified him to own all these things is that he is born as a son to his father. That's all. Nothing else. Not because he did so well. Not because he was so obedient. Not because he did everything right as he says. He says, I never disobeyed your commandment. He was not given two-thirds of his property because he never disobeyed his commandment. It's good that he never disobeyed his commandment. That's fine. But the blessing was not because he never disobeyed. The blessing was before that. Everything belonged to him before that. Hello. <laughs> See, that's a serious problem, my friend. Hello. Are you there? <laughs> a lot of people are there with that problem, you know. They're good people. But the problem is they think it's their good works that will qualify them for every good thing that comes from God. But the fact is, before you started doing any good works, God has already given every good thing to you. <laughs> this is a very serious flaw. The sinner is exactly the opposite. <laughs> you know, he disregards all the blessings and ignores every good thing and walks away from everything and suffers. This guy lives in here. He does not realize how all the good things have come to him. You know, there are many people in the church today, I'm not talking about this church, but Church of Jesus Christ, in the church today, that don't realize that, that how we are so blessed and what qualifies us for the blessings of God. It is not what we have done. It is the love of the Father. Before we ever did any good work, he has already blessed us with every blessing. Ephesians 1, 3 says, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus before the world began. <laughs> so all the blessings are ours. Then why do we live and do His commandments? Why do we follow and obey what He says? Eh? Why it's so important to do what He says? It's important because otherwise I'll be a thankless person. If He has done so much for me, and if I ignore his word and live as I liked, then what kind of thanklessness is that? You see, not one good deed that I've done qualifies me for blessing. Every blessing is already given. 
now every good deed i do i do in thankfulness to god as a gratitude to god because i love god because i want to do it i want to do it i'm thankful to god that's all you see why did jesus tell these stories you have, you have to understand this in order to understand the whole impact of the story why did jesus tell these three stories particularly this story all the three stories comes as a package so go back to luke chapter 15 verse 1 and 2 luke luke gives a two verse introduction which often times people don't even see they just go straight into the story and finish with the story don't go back to verse 1 and 2 in order to understand what's happening here luke gives us the context he says then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him this is the context jesus is having a meeting all the tax collectors and sinners are there you know a tax collectors in those days were considered worse than a sinner because jewish people resented the fact they had to pay tax to the roman government and these tax collectors were jewish people who collected tax from the jewish people and gave it to the roman government so the people hated them for doing that taking money from them and giving it to the government plus they would take more money than they are supposed to collect that's another problem so they were very resentful of these tax collectors they considered them as great sinners worse than sinners so it says tax collectors and sinners the worst kind of people you know they were there and then it says and the pharisees and scribes complained saying this man receives sinners and eats with them so he spoke this parable to them and then he starts with the parable of the lost sheep that's the context so the tax collectors and sinners are there jesus looks at them they are in need they are in sin they are in problem they are not happy they are not sleeping right they are taking money left and right and uh, sinning left and right running wild <laughs> living a riotous life like this prodigal son you won't be having good sleep you know so they are having trouble they are in a turmoil they are here in jesus meeting they want to hear his words it says they have come to hear his preaching because they realize this man has some answers so they are sitting and waiting to hear him speak and jesus sees them these people with needs he looks at them and then he looks at the other group they are the murmuring group they are the ones that are sitting there and criticizing jesus for having anything to do with the sinners and tax collectors they blame him saying he's having things to do with them and then he eats with them has much to do with the sinners so he spoke spoke a parable that's how it begins so he spoke a parable that's why he spoke a parable so he wants to talk to these two groups now the basic problem is there is a difference a big difference between jesus view of lostness and the pharisees view of lostness the pharisees thought that the sinners and the tax collectors are lost they are the lost we are children of abraham the tax collector and the sinner is the lost person jesus thinks both of them are lost it's a big difference so when jesus was giving this parable of the lost son i mean the the prodigal son i'm sure they were all very happy because they said well that's a good message for the sinner i'm glad for once he's talking about the sinner i hope that sinner is listening over there and this sinner is they're pointing out to people there you know i know what the pharisees are doing they're sitting in the in the meeting and saying look at that sinner is he listening he's speaking just for him you know how people are when they come, you know come to church and stuff you know they'll bring their wife and they'll needle and say that's just <laughs> that's it this is just for you today's message you better hear is just for you and the wife will say to the husband just for you the whole thing was just for you <laughs> so i'm sure the pharisees were sitting there and saying look at that's just for that guy he's a crooked sinner you know that's for that guy and they were enjoying probably what he was saying about the sinner and 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 so on and uh, about how they are lost and all that and uh, but there was a message there you know he was trying to tell them look they are lost and i have come to seek and save that which is lost i am associating with them for that reason i'm going to them i'm dining with them 
I'm talking with them so that I can win them. I can find them and I can bring them back to God. That's the message he's trying to convey. But anyway, talking about the sinner was no problem for Pharisee. You know, they're looking at him and they were, well, that's well and good. He's talking about the sinner. But then when he finished with verse 24, they thought that story is over. Then 25, he starts all over again about the older son. And now all the Pharisees are getting uneasy because it's now talking about them, the older son. <laughs> they got a serious problem. What is their problem? Their pride, the self-righteousness. They think their righteousness qualifies them before God. That that's how they are blessed. That they must get this and they must have this. They must have, because they have been so good. They have never violated the commandment. This is the approach to their life, to their spiritual life. They don't understand the love of God. They don't understand the grace of God. And Jesus is talking about them now. And uh, what is Jesus saying? He's basically saying three things. He says, those who are lost could be forgiven. Two, those who think they are not lost could be lost. Two, whether you are the Pharisee or the sinner, God loves both. That's the message, basically. With one accord, every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Come on, everybody. Every praise. It's to our God, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God, glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise. It's to our God. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise.